Welcome back, Rebel fans. You're listening to another episode of the Rebel Talk presented by the Rebel Walk. I'm Cam Wicker, and as always, I'm here with Zach Moreth, and we're here today to talk a little bit about just the, the past week in Ole Miss sports, really. We didn't get to talk to you guys earlier this week uh, with our usual recap of football. Um, also played some basketball games on Monday, both men's and women's. We'll talk about that here in a second. Um, but we'll get farther into this podcast and uh, get into the well-anticipated matchup of Ole Miss versus Georgia this Saturday. A uh, big-time game that um, has a lot of implications on playoff rankings uh, for both Georgia and Ole Miss moving forward. So um, with that, we'll hop right into basketball for you guys. Um, women's played on Monday. Coach Show and Team 50, they looked great against the number three team in the nation. Unfortunately, didn't pull out the win, lost by two. And if you ask me, I think they kind of shot themselves in the foot late in that game, uh, some late game turnovers, obviously the inbound play that kind of really sealed it at the end there. Um, but overall, watching that game, I didn't get to watch a ton of the first half. It seemed like offensively they were struggling a little bit first half, uh, missing some shots. As, uh, Kennedy Ty Williams wasn't shooting great from the field in the first half. Neither was K.K. Deans. K.K. Deans heated up in the second half, looked great throughout the game, made some big shots. Uh, but my key throughout that game was um, – Watching Juju Watkins go toe to toe with Maddie Sky on the offensive and Maddie Sky on the defensive end, um, really didn't know who Coach O was going to throw out there as the primary defender for Juju Watkins, but it seemed like it was Maddie Scott. And uh, from from what I saw, she she did a great job. Yeah, Cam, I, it was one of those games where you know I I was watching at the end after I, I wrapped up class, but it was just you could tell you know it's the first game of the season. That's kind of my takeaway from it. If you play that game in March, I think Ole Miss easily figures out a way to inbound the ball and win the game right i mean it, there were a couple of things that looked a couple really unorganized in the first half like we said lack of scoring and then kk deans completely turned it up really brought Ole miss back into the game and put them in a position to win uh they just were unable to capitalize and that's what happens when you allow great teams to get back into the game they're gonna go and win and that's exactly what happened but the future is bright man that's the number three team in the country with watkins who's by far the best player in the country and Ole Miss seemed to do a pretty good job. So, you know, big things ahead for Team 50. Absolutely. Um, really didn't know um, who Coach O was going to throw out there in the starting lineup. It seemed like uh, she kind of has that Chris Beard situation where she can put pretty much anybody out there. Um, you'd, you'd assume that KK Deans, Maddie Scott, and Kenny Ty Williams are locked into that lineup for the, for the remainder of the season. But I, I would assume to me a Sadler, uh, Christina Walla, and Star Jacobs will probably see a rotation there. Maybe even um, uh, Sierra Chano at some point, the freshman, she's been playing pretty well, a pretty good amount of minutes as well. Star Jacobs got the starting center spot in that game. She did not play in the next division game due to just precaution of the injury. Christina Wally got the start. Um, but Star Jacobs looked great, uh, played about the same amount of minutes as Christina Wally in this game against USC. Um, it seemed like, I, I believe I remember talking to you and, uh, and Evie about this before the game, uh, Zach, it was. It seemed like USC was looked a little bit bigger than Ole Miss on the floor at times in that game, especially the starting lineup. Uh, I don't know if that'll be a problem for Ole Miss moving forward. It doesn't seem like if you look at the roster, they're a small team. Um, yes, with the guard play with Tamia Sadler and KK Deans, probably a smaller uh, guard tandem there with those two, but it didn't seem like um, they matched up well against USC. So we'll have to see how they match up against uh, other SEC teams down the road. Um, looking forward for the women's basketball team, their next game is on Sunday at 2 p.m. against Arkansas Pine Bluff. I believe that's is uh, one of Coach Yo's, um alumni, so uh, it'll be a, a good little uh, game against one of her former colleges there. Um, that's all we got for women's basketball. Like I said, make sure to go out there and support them on Sunday after that Georgia game. Give you a little break, 2 p.m. game. You can uh, refresh after the after the Georgia game and uh, be able to go watch some, some basketball uh, in, in Pavilion on Sunday. Uh, moving into men's basketball, pretty good win for uh, for the for, for Coach Beard's team on uh, on Monday night. Um, not the greatest showing to start the game offensively. Uh, I believe Beard and Juju Murray talked about it before the game, I mean, after the game, after the win, saying that there wasn't necessarily bad shots they were taking in the beginning of the game. They were getting shots in the paint. They just weren't they weren't making them. Uh, Matt Morrell kind of struggled from the field most of the game. I think he finished with 11 points after kind of getting some shots up at the end of the game. Uh, but really the start of the show with Juju Murray could not miss. Seven for 10 shooting, four for five from three. Uh, surpassed a thousand points on his career, and uh, Coach Coach Beer gave him a shout out after the game. I believe he had uh, he was student athlete academic uh, academic student athlete of the month, I believe. So I uh, gave him a little shout out at the end of the game for that. Uh, but Juju Murray was uh, on fire in that game. Yeah, Cam, and this is exactly what we talked about for the entire offseason. It's how can Ole Miss get a true point guard to allow Juju to slide into that shooting guard role while still being able to kind of manage the court and his teammates. Uh, but just having many more opportunities to score the basket, and that's what we saw. Uh, in terms of Matt Morrell, I thought he was a little bit hesitant. I don't know if it's because Kermit Davis was in the building, the guy who 
kind of establish him to be that way. No, I'm kidding. Shout out to Kermit. He did a great job calling the game. Uh, but still, I'd like to see Matt a little more confident with the basketball. He's one of the best players on this team, uh, probably the biggest leader on the team, and he's got to go out there and really establish himself, is, himself, especially as the season carries on into SEC play. But we got a long ways to go. It felt like one of those early Ole Miss football games where they the scoreboard is not even close, but – you said it in one of your texts, Cam. It never felt like Ole Miss actually pulled away from the game. They won by 30-something, you know, huge win. But it never felt in the game as if it was completely over and Ole Miss had taken all the momentum. So shout out to Long Island. You know, they never quit against a very good SEC Ole Miss team. And similar to the women's team, you know, big things ahead. This team has the potential to do really anything, go as far as they want. And I'm really looking forward to seeing it. I believe – they're back in action Friday. Um, yeah. yeah, I'm looking forward to it, man. Absolutely. Uh, apologies for the sniffles, guys. Have a little bit under the weather today. But um, uh, like like Zach said, that, that team really just didn't seem like they were pulling away in that game. Um, I don't really think this is something that Coach Beard is really worried about. He talked about after the game, this is an elite offense. He talked about after the Illinois exhibition game, this, this team is going to have some special offensive moments throughout the year, especially when you have guys like he has in the starting lineup with Padula, Malik Dia, Dre Davis, um, Jamin Brakefield coming off the bench. And that's really what I want to talk about next. Jamin Brakefield, he could be one of the best six men, one of the best six men in the country yeah. this year. I know Beard kind of said that he has six starters on this team and Jamin Brakefield is probably that sixth starter. Um, but the way that this lineup is looking right now, it seems like Jamin's going to primarily come off the bench and, and play about the same amount of minutes as Malik D. Dre Davis right there, um, along with Mikael Brown Jones right behind him. Uh, but 12.7 boards, kind of similar to his game against uh, Illinois. It seems like that's where, where Jamin's probably going to settle in this year, around 12, 13 points a game, probably eight rebounds a game. He's probably going to be one of the better rebounders on this team this year. Um, watching Malik Dia play, he's very much an offensive player. Uh, I believe TJ, shout out TJ Oxley. He um, he was talking about it on, on, on X, saying that it seems like Malik Dia um, – He's gotten better on the perimeter defense, and that's really what Beard harped on last year. Uh, you had guys like uh, Jamarian Sharp and Musa Cisse who were great inside, great on inside defending, could block a lot of shots. And Malik Dia can do that too. I believe he blocked a couple of shots in that game uh, on, on Monday. It's, it's just when, when they're switching out to the perimeter, it seemed like Malik Dia actually um, was pretty active out there and was, was able to hold his ground. Uh, out there. Um, not a great night for Malik Dia, but I'm um, pretty sure that there's a lot of more special things to come from Dia throughout the season. Um, Sean Padula impacted the, the game on both ends of the floor, didn't have a great night. Uh, offensively, I believe he only had five points, but uh, about five or six assists as well. Um, that's something he's going to do all year. I'm assuming he's probably going to average about five plus assists a game. And he's going to manage this offense. And um, it, it didn't seem like he put up a lot of uh, a good shot selections, I guess, in that game against that little Long Island. But um, at times you could you could tell that um, same, similar with Morrell, it seemed like he was maybe uncomfortable with his shots early in that game. Uh, and then lastly, uh, John Ball and Eduardo Claffey, I think they'll be just fine. Um, rotating into this the back of that lineup for Ole Miss, kind of giving Chris Beard a, a those um that those fifth and sixth options on the second man uh rotation there. Uh but it seems like those two guys will probably be pretty good Ole Miss players for years to come. Yeah, there's a lot to develop with Bowl and Klafke, but you gotta understand this is really their first college basketball game. I know Klafke played overseas in professional leagues, but it's gonna take a little bit to, you know, kind of get accustomed to the physicality and the speed of the game. So I'm not concerned, and I don't anticipate them being huge roles on this team. Uh, but, you know, when you when you face Florida, who's has these monsters who are all seemingly above seven feet tall, John Bowles is going to have to play. Uh, so there's going to be in, instances in different teams where Bowles is going to have to get in the game. Uh, if someone gets injured, Klafke Klaff, is going to have to be ready to go. But there's a lot of depth on this team. Not worried at all about it, Cam. Absolutely. And um, just talking a little bit more about Claffy, watching him play throughout the game. It seems like he plays a little fast. Um, tend, you, you tend to see that from freshmen, yeah. uh, especially ones that maybe aren't as highly touted as some of the, you know, the five star guys, such as like Cooper Flagg uh, at, at Duke, uh, who's just kind of a, a different breed of a five star player at that point. But uh, Claffy has played professional ball. He's played in those NBA academies. And it seemed like at times that you could tell that he's running up and down the court, carrying the ball, uh, telling people he's got it uh, at the point guard position. So I, I think you'll see more of that out of Klafke throughout the season as he gets comfortable in this system. Uh, same with Ball as well. Doesn't look um, too comfortable right now, Ball, on the offensive end. Uh, but on the defensive end, he looks like he's settling, settling in just fine. Like Zach said, their next game is Friday. That'll be at 6 p.m. against Grambling State. Another scrappy team, just like Long Island, who's going to play some defense and dive all over the ball, all over the place. 
um, just like Long Island did on Monday. So um, I believe the Rebels will be ready for that one. And uh, like Zach said, big things to come for this for this men's team this year. Big big expectations this year, uh, starting the year ranked 24th. Uh, I think that's all we got for basketball for you guys. Just be sure to um, pay attention to those games, pay attention to uh, when those times are, and uh, get out and support uh, Coach Beer and Coach Show uh, throughout the season this year. Moving into football for Ole Miss, big weekend this past weekend for the offense. Uh, record-breaking performance from Jackson Dart, Jordan Watkins. School records broken by both of them. Uh, 63 to 31 win. I believe it was a seven-point spread uh, for the game. Uh, I believe there was an Arkansas fan that said he donated a thousand dollars for every point Ole Miss beat um, uh, Arkansas by. So uh, he, I believe he owes, 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 owes Ole Miss a lot of money there. Uh, but going back to the game. Uh, 515 yards, six touchdowns from Jackson Dart, 252 yards receiving, and five touchdowns from Jordan Watkins. It was it was just great to watch. Um, it seemed like every time he looked up, Jordan Watkins was sprinting down the sideline with the ball yeah. and scoring a touchdown. Um, you haven't really seen that out of an Ole Miss receiver in a while. Um, obviously, Trey Harris, the four touchdowns a, a year ago in week one. Uh, but that type of game you haven't really seen out of Ole Miss receivers, I feel like, since Elijah Moore, A.J. Brown, D.K. Metcalf type of guys um, that were really just taking over the game. And it seemed like at times Arkansas had no answer for Jackson Dart or Jordan Watkins. Um, but what I liked the most, Zach, uh, and I'm sure you liked it too, was the use of Daquan Wright. Um, didn't see a lot of priest corn uh, throughout the year this year. Um, saw him a little bit in that Oklahoma game. He got a touchdown pass. Um, thought he was going to be playing in this Arkansas game. Didn't really see him at all. I don't think we did see him take a snap. If he did, it maybe been a snap or two. Um, but Daquan Wright got out there, caught two touchdown passes, nine catches for 99 yards, and it seemed like Ole Miss kind of is figuring out how to implement this tight end play. It changes everything. And we've been harping on it for the entire season, right? Not just me, not just you, but the entire fan base. And it's been awesome to see, dude. I mean, Daquan Wright is a hell of a player. He's really gifted. Uh, for those who don't know, he – Weighs the same as Caden Priestcorn. He's just a couple inches shorter. But you wouldn't be able to tell that by the way that he moves and his athleticism and his yards after catch. You know, that ability is something that I don't want to look past because it feels like every time he caught the ball, he was getting yards, you know, after the catch and really expanding on those plays, which is promising. Uh, another thing from Arkansas, Jackson Dart, the deep ball was looking beautiful, man. And I said this in a different show, but – the Arkansas defensive backs are not good, right? I mean, we can all agree that's by far the worst part of their defense, and it's going to be a different secondary that we see in Georgia, clearly. But Dart was still able to hit those passes, something that we saw him struggle against versus LSU. We saw him do it in the second half against Oklahoma. So now that's two games in a row when Dart's really starting to get accurate. I think he was 25 for 31, uh, 500 whatever yards, just an incredible performance. But if there's a time to get right, this is the time, Cam, and he's doing it. So Ole Miss has all the momentum right now. I mean, let's not kid ourselves. Georgia is questionable at times. I'm not saying they don't have the talent to go beat anyone in the country and the coaching staff because we all know they do. Uh, but Ole Miss is playing well right now. I mean, all around, I think that was their best game of the season at Arkansas. And the key thing for me is just Jackson Dark because if he can make these throws – you can beat Georgia. You could have beat LSU, and you probably should have beat LSU if Jackson Dart makes a few bet a few better throws uh, or a couple more reads that you know when you're finding the open guy, which now he's doing. So when Dart's on like this, man, I I think Ole Miss has the potential to beat anybody in the country, and hopefully he goes out uh, to prove that on Saturday. Absolutely. I believe Kiffin said it uh, on Monday or after the game, saying that this is probably the most accurate he's seen Dart all year, at least some um, just not really completion percentage wise, but just throwing the football uh, and, and the accuracy on the deep ball, really, like Zach said, um, not really having Jordan Watkins having a break stride on any of those deep balls at all. Same yeah. with Daquan Wright hitting him over the middle of the field. Um, it's uh, It seems like when, when he's most comfortable is, is when he's just back there standing there. And uh, I believe if you shout out TJ Alex again, if you look back at uh, a couple weeks ago, he put out a, a thread of uh, just kind of some some stats about how uh, Darts, when he stays clean, he's one of the highest rated passing quarterbacks in college football. Uh, if you can keep Dart clean, which is going to be hard to do against a, a fierce Georgia defense this weekend, but if you can keep him clean at times throughout this game, he, he can make those plays like he did against Arkansas. Obviously a tougher defense, a tougher secondary, a lot tougher of a defensive line, uh, but uh, it's it's a game that, um, that, that Dart needs to show up for and, and needs to continue doing what he's been doing. Uh, talking a little bit more 
about the Arkansas before we move Arkansas game before we move into Georgia. Um, the play calling in this game. Uh, I wanted to talk about that a little bit. Um, obviously, some 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 plays out there where you, where you're still questioning a little bit, but from the, for the most part, it seemed like. Ole Miss was kind of clicking on all cylinders on the offensive end. It seemed like Charlie Wise and Lane Kiffin were drawing up all the right things at times uh, to negate the Arkansas defense, and, and you just want to see that for the rest of the season. Yeah, and this is – I keep repeating myself, but, like, this is the Ole Miss team that we were promised. You know, this is – these getting the ball in the hands of the playmakers. We saw Juice Wells really make a statement on that first drive, and I know he went quiet for the rest of the game. Uh, but then you see Jordan Watkins pick it up and Daquan Wright – um, Dominic Thomas, Caden Lee. Caden Lee, hell yeah, sleeper performance from Lee. I think he catches for 125 yards, and I'm forgetting to talk about it. Like, that's a perfect example. Um, Dominic Thomas comes in as running back, and though I didn't agree with the decision at the time, Dominic Thomas might be one of the only running backs on this team that falls forward when he gets tackled, Cam. So instead of getting drugged back a few yards, he's actually picking up an extra yard or two. Uh, he weighs 210 pounds more than Bentley and Henry Parrish, which, by the way, I hope he's okay. He probably won't return for the rest of the season. So prayers are up to Parrish. But I think Thomas is absolutely going to get some carries against Georgia uh, because now you have that mix-and-match type running back situation similar to last year. Uh, Judkins was a guy who, when he found the open hole, he found the open spot. It was boom. He hit it fast. There he goes. Bentley, he's very patient. He's going to wait for the open spot. His feet are always moving, and he's looking to cut back here and there. And Thomas is a guy who he's very straightforward, and he's going to try and get you positive yards. And I think that match is going to work well against Georgia. But obviously, before we get into Georgia, anything else that you have on Arkansas, Cam, feel free. Absolutely. I think that's all I got on Arkansas. I guess before we move into Georgia, I want to talk a little bit about uh, just kind of an injury update. Uh, you guys will probably be watching this after the injury report comes out. We were recording this before the injury report comes out tonight, uh, so we're not sure who will be on that for Ole Miss this week. But two things for certain that we can kind of guess off the top of our heads. We'll probably see Trey Harris questionable again on this on this injury yeah. report um, <laughs> just for, for game planning reasons for Lane Kiffin, I'm assuming. Uh, and then, like Zach said, probably won't see Henry Parrish for the rest of the season. It was tough to see that um, him go out in the wheelchair on that game. Uh, you can tell he was very emotional when he was getting off uh, that field. And even asking Dominique Thomas earlier this week at the podium about how Henry Parrish take he was taking it, he, he admitted he was taking it pretty tough. It's kind of hard to um, accept that that's uh, that's it for college football for you. Um, but if, as good as a player as Henry Parrish is, I'm, I'm sure he'll get a shot at the next level for somebody. Um, talking a little bit about the running back situation since we're on the injury report, uh, like Zach said, kind of have that that last year uh, feeling with with um, Dominic Thomas and Bentley back there in the backfield that Thomas kind of falls forward. And if you haven't heard the story on Thomas, go look it up. It's it's a it's a tragic story, but it's uh, it's very, um, um, uh, I guess, motivating uh, to to anybody who's just kind of going through anything. And you can you can tell that this is a guy who, who is fighting through a lot and uh, he, he's he's persevering to, to be the type of football player that he wants to be, and the type of person that he wants to be. And uh, now he gets a chance to show everybody what he's got on the field this Saturday in the biggest game of the year for Ole Miss. Um, so uh, all hoping good things for Dominic Thomas there. Um, but th like Zach said, this is a guy who's, who's a pretty big guy. I believe me and Zach talked about it uh, at, uh, when he left the podium on Monday or on Tuesday. Uh, he's got some pretty big legs on him. He's got logs for legs. He's about 215 pounds. I believe he's only 5'8", 5'9". Uh, but if you're standing at 215 pounds at, at that height, um, then that's, you're a pretty big guy. And it seems like uh, at times uh, you're going to need that for Ole Miss against a D-line like Georgia. In, in in addition to his running and being able to get those short yardage, your short yardage plays, the pass pro is going to be crucial. I mean, Cam and I were talking about this before the podcast, but if you watch some of these plays that Kirby Smart's scheming up for his defense with that linebacker core of CJ Allen, Jalen Walker, Chaz Chambliss, these dudes are getting after the quarterback at an unbelievable level. Jalen Walker, three sacks against Texas. Chaz Chambliss, he gets two sacks against Texas and then two more against Florida. So the question of the game, for me, slowly moves into that offensive line matchup. And I think it applies on the other side as well. I think the Ole Miss defensive line has a chance to really disrupt Carson Beck, who went one for eight under pressure last week and threw three interceptions, which is kind of a mind-boggling stat for a guy who looked like a – unremarkable quarterback last year. I mean, if you go back to that Ole Miss game, Carson Beck looked like 2019 Joe Burrow, man. Dicing us up, finding 
everyone on the field. But I think what fans are forgetting is that Lad McConkey and Brock Bowers, who are tearing it up in the NFL, aren't on this offense anymore. Two guys who were absolutely menacing for this Ole Miss defense and for every defense that Georgia played last year. Absolutely. Go ahead, Ken. Yeah, absolutely. I was just talking, going off of that, uh, with looking at the stats for, for Carson Beck last year, almost 4,000 yards passing, 24 touchdowns, yeah. six picks. Um, this year he has 11, which is second most in the country, uh, leading the SEC in uh, most interceptions so far. So um, this this hasn't been the same type of Carson Beck we saw last year. This is a guy that was supposed to be a top five draft pick to start the year. I don't really seen too much talks about that anymore. Obviously there's potential there. There's arm talent there. He's a big guy. He has that quarterback NFL frame, uh, but it just, it seemed like without the playmakers, like Zach said, it hasn't been the same Carson Beck we've seen. Not at all. And, you know, going back to what I was saying about the defensive line against LSU, you know, probably the best offensive line in the country in terms of preventing sacks and pressure on their quarterback, Ole Miss recorded zero sacks, zero, a team who's gotten 18 sacks in the last two games against Oklahoma and Arkansas. Now the key for me here, Cam, they're playing that game against LSU without Prince Uman Mielin, who is a projectable first round pick, arguably the best pass rusher in the country. And he doesn't play against LSU. Now you throw him in the mix against Georgia. I really, I think this pass rush is going to eat, man. And Georgia is a team that doesn't really give up a lot of sacks but I think the key for me is Ole Miss to get three sacks. I think that's the number. If you get three sacks, you know, sacks, they show a lot less than the actual stat because if a team's getting a lot of sacks, you're not counting the plays that they're in the backfield, just making life hell for the opposing quarterback. And if you can get three sacks on Carson Beck, like I said, we're not accounting for the plays where Beck has to scramble out and make a terrible throw or scramble out and throw the ball away or simply, you know, slide for a one or two yard gain. So it's going to be crucial to really apply pressure. And on the flip side, you have to protect Jackson Dart, man. I mean, we taught, we just said it. Dart is in his prime when he has time to throw the ball and go through his progressions and make reads. And if he doesn't have that, the offense is going to look just how it did against LSU. Stagnant. They're not going to be able to move the ball. They're probably going to hand the ball off more than they want to. Um, but another topic that brings up for me, Cam, Looks like some rain on the forecast here, man. I, I'm curious to get your thoughts. Who do you really think that benefits and what impact do you think that can play in this game? Absolutely. That's um, on my offensive keys to the game right here. Obviously, affects both sides of the ball, uh, but um, really that's kind of my main thing for, for the offense in this game. Uh, you got to prepare for a sloppy, rainy, run the football, uh, dump it off to the tight ends, dump it off to, to Trey Harris and Jordan Watkins and Caden Lee and let them get yards. This is a game that's that we've always said that we hear every week Nick Saban talk about on college game day uh, with these big time games. You got to win these games in the trenches. Uh, this, this, if it's going to be sloppy out there, if it's going to be raining, you have to be good up front. And if, if the Ole Miss offensive line is not going to be as good as you want them to be up front, the Ole Miss defensive line is going to have to make up for it. And uh, I believe that's, that's going to be the key in that game. Yeah, absolutely, man. And then just moving into the secondary, Obviously, I think the most questionable part of the team for Ole Miss is their secondary. We've done a really nice job. But, you know, when you look at the, the guys who they've struggled against, um, you know, you look at Dane Key, Kyron Lacey, Andrew Armstrong. These guys are all 6'2", 6 6'3", 6 6 Now, I, I don't know how much this goes into the actual gameplay, but Georgia has three really decent wide receivers who we should probably get familiar with. Arian Smith, Dominic Lovett, and Dylan Bell. But none of them have that size. They don't have that Trey Harris frame, that Kyron Lacey NFL 6'3 build. They're all around that six-foot mark. And I think that plays really nicely into the secondary of Ole Miss because we're a small secondary. Aside from Trey Amos, Trey Washington, John Saunders, Lewis Moore, these are smaller type guys. Obviously, John Saunders is a bigger guy as well. But I don't know if he'll be guarding one-on-one -on -one a lot. Uh, but I, I like that advantage for Ole Miss. I think – if you were going against Brock Bowers, just an absolute freak, I, I would give advantage to Georgia. But I think it levels the playing field a little bit and allows you to go make plays on the throws that Carson Beck is absolutely going to botch. 
Absolutely. Um, pretty much the same thing I, I have here on, on my keys to the game. This smaller group of receivers for, for Georgia. Uh, I believe the fourth option is uh, London Humphreys. I believe he's about 6'2", 6'3", 200. I uh, haven't really seen a lot out of him. Obviously, he was kind of that same type of player as Lad McConkie, just a little bit bigger, more of a route runner type of guy. Um, but I um, haven't really seen much out of the tight end play from Georgia this year. Uh, the yeah. kind of same, similar to way Ole Miss kind of just dump off here and there, let him get some yards. I uh, haven't obviously seen more out of Ole Miss's tight ends these past couple of weeks, uh, but obviously not the same Brock Bowers to situation that you uh, had to deal with a year ago uh, playing a Georgia team. Um, so it's a lot easier to zero in on uh, one player, and that's really got to be Carson Beck. You got to get after him. That's that's my key to the defense for this game. You got to get after Carson Beck. He's only been sacked eight times on the year, but he's been pressured 66. That's just about middle of the pack of the SEC. Yeah. And I believe the most important stat here is if you go on PFF, uh, Pro Football Focus, uh, Carson Beck is at the bottom of the SEC and, and close to the bottom of the country when pressured uh, with a passer rating of 33.2. Um, so he hasn't been great under pressure this year. I believe Jackson Dart, uh, for reference, uh, is, is about a 60 uh, point, 60 and a half uh, graded passer when under pressure. So a lot better uh, from Dart so far this year under pressure than than Carson Beck. Obviously, 11 interceptions. You see him throw three last week. You see him throw three uh, in the game against Bama. You see him throw three in the game against Texas. It seems like in the bigger games, especially early on in the games, Carson Beck turns the ball over. Uh, obviously, we've seen him light it up in the second half of those games, it seems like, uh, and end up throwing for over 300 yards. Uh, most of the time, he's going to throw the ball 40 times, especially if you're down, uh, if, if Georgia's down in those games. So you have to be prepared for that. I uh, talked about this also before the podcast. Uh, surprisingly, Georgia is the second worst rushing attack in the SEC. Yeah. Um, only above LSU. Obviously, Ole Miss lost that game to LSU. Gary Nussemeyer was kind of carving up that Ole Miss defense at times. You can't let that happen in this game against Carson Beck. Uh, if you if you watch a lot of Georgia football, um, you, you can you can see the way that they kind of want this offense to work. They, they want to get the run going first. They want to try to get – three, four or five yards here and then play action off of that. Uh, let Beck kind of roll out and get someone down the field. Uh, you can't let that happen, especially if it's going to be play action. You want this old, old Miss defensive line, just get after Carson Beck at times. Uh, like like Zach said, the, the Georgia linebackers are going to be getting after Jackson Dart. We don't see a ton of, of Pete Golden sending linebackers for Ole Miss. Probably still won't see a ton of that this weekend. You see Poo Paul kind of run through there sometimes and find his way in the backfield. But um, other than last weekend when T.J. Dottery got in the backfield in the end zone on that play to, to, uh, to result in a touchdown for Ole Miss, I hadn't really seen a lot of T.J. Dottery getting into the backfield or, or just going in there for a blitz like he did uh, in that game in the Peach Bowl off the edge that year. Um, so um, really just – the key for Ole Miss is getting Perkins back there in the backfield, getting Princely in the backfield, and stopping that run up front with J.J. Pegues, uh, Jamarius Brown, who's played great so far uh, this year. Shout out to Jamarius Brown. Kind of overshined a little bit uh, by Walter Nolan and J.J. Pegues, uh, but Jamarius Brown is probably going to be a pretty key piece to this team moving forward. Uh, that, for, for, the, for the rest of the defense, uh, that's just really all I got other than limiting the tight ends. Um, like I said, they don't throw to these guys a lot, but, but when, when it's a sloppy game like this, you want to watch those guys. Spot on, Cam. I hundred percent these it's a winnable game. And that's what Ole Miss fans have to realize. It's in a different stratosphere as last year. And even last year, I, as an old delusional Ole Miss fan, I'm thinking, yeah, you know, we're going to go to Athens. We're going to knock them off. We're going to screw up the whole season, but it feels just more realistic this year. And when talking about my keys to the game, I mentioned it earlier, but I think if one team is going to get the upper hand, it's going to be the team that can record three or more sacks. I think that's the story of the game. Defense is going to win this game, Cam. Three or more sacks. If Ole Miss gets three sacks, that means Carson Carson Beck's going to be in hell all day long, and that means he's going to force the ball and probably throw some interceptions. On the flip side, if Georgia gets three or more sacks, Jackson Dart's the one in hell, and we see what that looks like against LSU. Jackson Dart can't make plays. The play calling falls apart when there's constant pressure, and the Ole Miss offense simply just can't move the ball. Second key of the game, you have to win third downs. Very similar to what I was saying. Both these offenses are in the middle of the pack on third down offense, but both defenses are top 10 in the country on third down defense. So what team is able to convert on third downs and move the ball down the field uh, versus the other, right? And then the last thing for Ole Miss, you have to score more than 27. Uh, this is a Georgia team who's scored 30 in, I think, every game except the Kentucky game. Um, and you have to prevent Georgia from scoring 28. I think you can do that. I think this is a defense 
maybe the best defense that Georgia's faced, uh, but I got to give them the, I got to give Ole Miss the upper hand here, just knowing that they're going to be in Vaught Hemingway Stadium, uh, staying home for the weekend. Unfortunately, Cam, you know, this is bad news for Ole Miss fans, but as a score prediction, I have Georgia winning 29 to 27. Absolutely. Um, my keys to the game, kind of similar to yours, kind of got to go for, for the offense, at least, uh, kind of guys convert on third down. You got to, you got to be there on third down. You don't want to leave this up to, to fourth down plays like you, like you have in the past, uh, for these old Miss teams. Um, and then also finding a way to just get this run game going. We talked about it a couple of times in this podcast. It's going to be probably a sloppy game, probably going to be raining, uh, around that time of the day as well. So, um, you kind of want to find a balance here with Tom, with Dominic Thomas and Bentley on the ground, uh, and, and take some pressure off of Dart in that passing game. Uh, similar to you, Zach, is um, got to go away from the heart of, of being a, a lifelong <laughs> rebel here. And uh, I'm, I'm going to go with Georgia 21, Ole Miss 20 in this game on, on Saturday. Yeah. And, and just to – here's my rationale thinking. If I'm picking the other team and I expect them to win, then I'm going to be a little, a little less heartbroken if Ole Miss loses, right? But if then if Ole Miss wins, it's like, wow. Uh, no, but seriously, going into that, it's been a struggle for me to do this, this pick. Obviously, you never want to pick against Ole Miss. But – you know, Lane Kiffin has a lot to prove. You look at Alabama 2021 with Matt Corral, massive disappointment. Alabama 2022 with Jackson Dart, massive disappointment. Alabama last year, massive, massive disappointment in Tuscaloosa. That, that, was, that one stung a lot because it kind of ruined the whole season. And then you go to Georgia and you get absolutely embarrassed last year. Lane has been unable to get over the hump of Alabama and Georgia for his whole time here at Ole Miss. And now with this roster that he's constructed in Vaught Hemingway Stadium, he has a chance to silence everyone and essentially seal a bid for Ole Miss in the 12-team playoff. But that's kind of my reasoning for picking Georgia. I hope I'm proven wrong. Absolutely. Ole Miss ranks 16th in that college football playoff ranking. Georgia bumped down a spot uh, from the AP to number three in the college football ranking. So like I said, to start the podcast, this is a very um, high stakes game for both Georgia and Ole Miss. Wouldn't be surprised if you even if you even if Ole Miss wins this game, uh, you still see Georgia in the top 15. Uh, and I very much see that coming if that happens. And it'll probably just be uh, up in the air where you see Ole Miss after that, uh, probably inside the top 10. If I'd have to say but I have to take a guess there. Uh, but uh, I believe that's all we got for the keys to the game this week uh, for Ole Miss versus Georgia. Is that all you got, Zach? Yeah, man, that's it. That's all we got for you guys this week. That Ole Miss game versus George will be at 2.30 p.m. on ABC. Uh, supposed to be a, a overcast game, probably raining in that game. So if you're going to be out there, uh, um, dress dress correctly, I guess. Um, and then bring, bring a poncho, bring bring a rain jacket, something to kind of get ready for that game. It shouldn't be too cold. So even with the rain, it shouldn't be too bad on the fans. Uh, going to be my last game in the student section uh, as an Ole Miss student. So uh, finally getting to, to go back into the student section for a week. Uh, still probably going to have some coverage for you guys, probably tweets here and there while in the stands, just on some opinions on the game. Uh, but won't be my normal routine of being in the booth this pet this coming up weekend. So uh, it, it'll be a very fun uh, memory making weekend uh, for, for me as an Ole Miss student one last time. But like I said, 2.30 p.m. on uh, ABC Ole Miss versus Georgia. Uh, that's all we got for you guys this week. Stay tuned to the Rebel Walk for all your Ole Miss sports needs. Mm-hmm.